I call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we please have a moment of silence for those that are missing in action and prisoners of war? Thank you. Okay, um, before moving forward with the agenda, I would just like um, to ask council members um, uh, the community engagement presentation, uh, the awardee could not be here tonight. And um, I would just ask if, we, if you guys were okay, if we uh, put that on the meeting for the next agenda and uh, we honored the awardee then. Is that okay? Do you want to make a motion for or against one? Uh, yeah, make a motion to do so. All right, so could I have a, could I have? I'll make a motion for that. A motion? I'll, I'll second it based on who the recipient is. <laughs> All right, the motion on the floor is to move the Irish Heritage and Month Award presentation to our April 3rd meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, Secretary Billups, can I please have a roll call vote? <laughs> A roll call vote? I'm sorry, can I please have an attendance? Okay. Yeah. We can do a roll call vote too if you want. <laughs> um, Councilor Wagner? Here. Councilor Brandis? Here. Councilor Andrusco? Here. Councilor Blackwell? Present. Councilor Heyman? Here. Councilor Banto? Yes. President Tunis? Here. Secretary Billups is here. Councilor Minnick? Here. Councilor Silva? Here. Councilor Wentz? Here. And thank you. Um, we have our Honorable Mayor Ed Brown. We have um, solicitors uh, Kilkenny and Gallagher. We have um, CAO Jones. We have um, uh, Brianna. We have um, our new CAO. Hi. Chief Municipal Clerk, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Kate. We have um, Officer Colella and Officer Bateman. We have um, Sergeant Gray, and of course, all of you, um, the Upper Darby uh, residents. How are you guys tonight? Are you going well? Good. Thank you, Secretary Billups. Rules of meeting decorum. Upper Darby residents have the opportunity to speak for three minutes. Residents are prohibited from making threats, using profanity, or acting in a manner that would impede or prevent the conduct of the business of the meeting. Any person who attends the meeting and makes remarks, disrupts, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the meeting after receiving a verbal warning may be required to leave the meeting at the discretion of the council president. Public forum shall not exceed 30 minutes. If a resident chooses to ask questions, they are voluntarily giving up their time for a response. This means that the three minute timer uh, will continue to run no matter who is speaking. The timer will be clearly displayed on the screen. Uh, Secretary Billups. So first, first we have Shelly Hoyt. Shelly Hoyt. God, that echoes. Um, I'm going to read. I have four pages here. It's only definitions that I got from the Oxford Dictionary online. The word review, a formal assessment or examination of something with the possibility or intention of instituting change if necessary, a comprehensive review of defense policy, of defense policy. Teamwork is the collaborative effort of a group to achieve a common goal or to complete a task in an effective and efficient way. Teamwork is seen within the framework of a team, which is a group of interdependent individuals who work together towards a goal. Ordinance, this one's gonna be hard for me, so bear with my tongue tied. An ordinance is a law created by local government, such as city, a city council or county board of supervisors. Local, local governments can only create laws on matters that the state government says they can. Ordinances can cover a variety of topics, including things like zonings and renting building requirements. That was hard. Um, oh, two of the same page. Okay, so that's it. So maybe the fourth page is on there. Um, 
and, and this isn't for any question, this is all food for thought. When you asked us all to work together, we're trying. Um, I would like to see council try. My ask, and I don't know if it's even possible, but when you guys vote a yes or a no, maybe telling us the public what your reasons are. Maybe you can convince us for the opposite opinion that we're thinking. Like, you know, everybody says yes, 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 no, 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 per party. Let us know the reason. So maybe, you know, your ideas could perhaps be a better way to convince us instead of just making us divided. Um, and this rope thing here is also like another division of like, we're powerful and you guys don't count, in my humble opinion. Thank you, and I have 57 seconds. Thank you. Next is Steve Lockhart. Hi, Steve Lockhart, 427 Spruce Avenue. I have some other flyers. Uh, at the end of April is uh, Earth Day, so the uh, UDEAC, Environmental Advisory Committee, and the tree tenders of Upper Darby and the Upper Darby Trails are sponsoring a hike, bike, and roll trail challenge. It's be on Saturday, April 27th, Sunday, April 28th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. We'll have tables set up at Gillespie Park on North Sycamore Road in Clifton Heights, the new trail behind the Wawa uh, at the Drexel Line Shopping Center, and also at Chapman Park off Palton Avenue in Lansdowne. Volunteers will meet you at these uh, sites. Uh, we'll have maps uh, of other trails besides these three and directions to get to those trails. A passport will be uh, available to document your participation. Uh, you can bring skates, scooters, sneakers, strollers, wheelchairs, bikes, rollerblades to explore these three accessible trails, and along the way, uh, check out recent shrub and tree plantings designed to help keep our air and streams clean. Other trails may best be suited for hiking due to mud or vegetation. You've never seen Upper Darby quite like this. Two days, 12, dra 12 trails, hike one or more. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Becky Duggan. I dropped my pen. Am I allowed to go over and get it? Please don't start my time. I haven't started yet. I dropped my pen. Can I get it? It's on the other side of the rope. Please restart my time. Uh, I guess not. Okay. Uh, is, okay. Can you just, I'll just please keep start talking until I'm done yeah. Okay. Uh, Becky Duggan. On January 18th. Can you give us one second so we can restart your time? Okay. Whatever. This is really too convoluted. Uh, on January 18th, 2023, there was a public hearing on ordinance number 3133 for the purchase of zero Wycombe Avenue lands down. The ordinance clearly stated that the township desired to purchase this property. On August 2nd, 2023, there was a public hearing on ordinance 3139 to revitalize the business district of the township. There was no mention of a purchase of a property. On December 20th, 2023, the township purchased 3620 Garrett Road using money from Ordinance 3139. I heard the explanation of why that's legal. But based upon that, everybody, let's say this is Edmonds Avenue. You're west, I'm east, I'm on the east side. Everybody on the west side, or west of Edmonds Avenue, gets $15 million to share. Would you agree you want to share with all of us too? I think you'd rather say, no, this is west. I bet you would. <clears throat> so... This is Edmund Avenue, you're West, you can split 15 million between you, or you have to share it with all of us. That's the same exact reasoning you gave Solicitor Gallagher for why the property could have been purchased under that ordinance. The residents and business owners were not allowed to speak to the purchase of the public hearing because Ordinance 3139 did not list it in there. So in essence, you disenfranchised all the residents and business owners from being allowed to speak on it. We were all disenfranchised. One of the different topics, very important to me. Scranton has a population of just under 76,000 people with a police force of 147. Erie has a population of 93,000 with a police force of 192. Harrisburg had a population of 50,000 as of 2022. 
<clears throat> and they have a police force of 136, hoping to get it to 162 by the end of 2024. Now, Upper Darby's population is around 89,000, 85,000, give or take. We have a police force of 133. Now, as we've mentioned multiple times in these meetings, I do not do math, but even looking at these numbers, you can see that these populations, with the exception of Erie, are lower than ours, but they have more police than we do. I can, you can see, obviously, that we're extremely understaffed. And I hope going forward that would be considered, considering how things have been going recently in this township. And my third topic I want to bring up, on February 15th, I brought up the, the problem on Tobacco Road, right at the entrance of Observatory Park, where it's a dangerous condition for children entering. It's right near the entrance of the park. I want to find out what has been done to fix that, if anything. Okay, I guess the kids will have to trip and fall and sue the township. <laughs> Nobody cares if the kids get hurt. Got it. Next is John Vazari. <clears throat> Good evening, John Vazari. As many of you know, <clears throat> I've since 2022, I've been closely tracking ARPA funds due to the misappropriation of these funds at the hands of Vince Ronjoni and Barbara Ann Keffer. The internal count, accounting and tracking of these funds are, in my opinion, unacceptable. There are way too many adjustments and being made after the fact because entries are being applied to one line item and then moved to another line item a month or two later. This leads me to believe the same is happening with the regular day-to-day -day transactions of the township. For example, uh, $3,113.90 was adjusted, backdated to 1231-23. However, that is not the day the adjustment was made <clears throat> as it was not on the December 2023 report or the January 24th, January 24 report I re that I received in January and February of this year. Additionally, there are entries without any detailed information or cross-references. These adjustments and other questionable items appeared from my recent request for an updated full year 2023 report. The adjustment was for four transactions ranging from October 2023 to December 2023 and was originally applied to the Fernwood Interceptor Professional Services then moved to other sewer improvements professional services. Also some big ticket items such as a $70,000 entry referencing a check run date of 3 7 24 was applied to the NFP grant for St. Dorothy's and backdated to 1231-23 with no details, invoices, et cetera. A new entry was for approximately 253,000 was applied to the ARPA allocated Fernwood Interceptor capital construction backdated to 1231-23 with no additional details, invoices, et cetera. And another one for 969,000 applied to ARPA allocation for other sewer capital construction, backdated to 1231 with no additional details, invoices, et cetera. Furthermore, if this is ARPA money, there was a special account set up for ARPA for disbursements and all money should be coming from that account, should not be transferred to, into any other account for disbursement. Secondly, I want to talk to, this is my third time going to ask the solicitor to provide the case law that was referenced during the February 7th meeting, justifying a vote that was taken via email to introduce and advertise the three new ordinances. The electronic vote taken on February 5th and again on the 6th, along with the publication of the advertisement of February 6th and 7th, was in violation of the PA Sunshine Act, which requires all votes to be done at a public meeting. The vote taken on February 7th was not for the purpose of voting to introduce and advertise the ordinance. Thank you. Um, next is, I'm sorry, because I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Yasa. Yasa. Thank you. My name is Yasa Molue. I live on Cavern Road, Upper Darby. My being here today is because uh, since September tw um, September 27, 2023, our block, we signed up for permit parking. 
and we were told it was going to be approved when we came here to vote in November. But since then, we have not heard from Upper Derby. And we are very tired of looking for parking space when we come home at night from work and we can't find nowhere to park. One of my neighbor got in touch with the councilman to follow up with the letter, with the papers that we signed. And councilman told my neighbor that he didn't have enough people, 10 people were missing from the lakes. So because of that, we were not qualified. But when we received the paper, it was three pages. And the three pages everybody signed is filled. It's a pathetic So we don't understand why he said we are not qualified. And further to that, when my neighbor asked him, then what do we do next? He said, but then y'all go to the police. How do we go to the police? So that's the reason why I had to make it my business to come hey. to this meeting today. Because Ms. I have lived on this block for over 20 years, and right now parking is just terrible. I can hand it list over to you. So Ms. Ms. Yasa, I, I am your council person, and you guys um, submitted the, the form correctly, but once you submit the form, um, our police department goes out and they have to make sure that it's correct. Uh, after they did their check, um, Calvin, Road, Calvin Road had 10 houses that um, were not on the list and uh, Brent Road had 12. My, t my time is running out. Yeah, your time. The initial time when they had a meeting, I was in Africa. When they yeah. had a meeting, we were told as long as 80% of the people signed, we yeah. were going to be qualified. So that 10 people that they signed, we're not really concerned about them that much because some of them just they're renting. So yeah. they really don't care what goes on. We don't want to have property there and paying taxes. So we need you to push it so we can be qualified for it. You have permit, I think, on your block, right? Yeah, so we we do have, we, we did receive the forms, right? The police department, they have to verify. So if they tell me it's not 80%, it's not 80%. I did give, I did notify your neighbor and give her the form and let her know. I also talked to residents on Brent that said they found another person as well. So it's something that's on my radar and I'm working on. We didn't go on Brent Road. We only did Calvin Road. No, I understand it was, it, yeah, when we had the meeting, it was for both streets. Okay. And so they, they are separate, but until the police department can verify that it's 80%, we can't implement it. They, they're the ones that have to verify. We have a community police officer that works extremely hard. So we have to take that list to Upper Derby Police? No, no. So <laughs> you can you can talk to Officer Bateman, yeah. But the, the police department has to verify it's at eighty percent, and and I will connect with you if he can hang out at, at the end of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Next is Joanne Namaba. Joanne Namavong. Um, I want to give another shout out like I did before to the ladies in the one center. Um, I'm not going to name them. They know who they are, but they do an amazing job. There's been a few people. I know people are starting to come in to pay their taxes. And I know of a number of people that have overpaid their taxes. They, they looked at the wrong line. And the ladies there at the one center, they catch them and they, they, they call them on the phone or they find them, they connect with them to, to tell them so that they can get a new check. Um, they don't just cash it, they, they do something. So I think that they're doing an amazing job and I think people should recognize their hard work. Um, second, I had the, I guess it's unfortunate, experience to have some interactions with the police department this week. Um, and last week, um, my daughter's identity was stolen from from source from Westchester University. Um, so if anybody that's listening has students at Westchester University, you better check it because they're stealing the kids' social security numbers. But in any case, I spoke with an officer that came to my house and took a report. He was wonderful. Officer, I don't remember his name, Le Bombard. It was great. Um, and then I spoke to Detective Pucci, who couldn't really help me, but he did give me some information and told me what to do if you are the victim of uh, identity theft. So I do appreciate um, the work of the officers and the detectives that are, you know, trying to help with these things. Now, um, a couple other things. I have a question about the property on Westchester Pike that had the fire last spring. It's been almost a year. Um, do you guys know what the status of that is? Is there like a problem with the insurance proceeds or? Because like the roof is falling in more, like it's gotten worse. 
Do you know Danielle or no? I don't know, but I would like to know as well. Okay. So I don't know. Is that like codes or like who, who is that? I think it would be L and I, and we'll, L &I. now that you brought it to our attention, we'll okay. find that out. I'll okay, great. Thank you. And get that answer. Okay. Okay, thank you. Pacific is right. at Westchester Pike at Linden Avenue. Yeah, it's up. It's up. Yeah, it's going towards Havertown on the on the south side. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is um, this is just a story I'm going to tell. Um, <clears throat> I live on the east side of my street, and. Across the street from me, I wanted to put up a fence in the neighbor's yard, and I started to do that, and they got very angry with me. And I said, well, you know, my house abuts my street, your house, your property abuts it. So since my property abuts it, then it counts on the other side of the street as well. That is the logic that was given by Solicitor Gallagher from Kilkenny Law. So I think that, you know, if I stepped on this side of the rope, would that upset you? If I stepped on this piece of real estate, it's really the same. Gallagher said this is the same real estate as that. Thank you. That's not allowed. You guys have no answers. Thank you. Next is Mary, Al Mary, I'm sorry, Mary Ellen Oxner. Good evening, Mary Ellen Oxner. It has been 252 days since money was approved out of the ARPA funds for our police, our firehouses, our parks, the business districts, and the Watkins Center. It's been 231 days since money was approved for um, Senior Center, Arts and Education Center, and Trash Trucks, and skip them because I got confused. It, it, regardless, it's been way too long. That money should be dispersed. Apparently, some of it is being dispersed, but... Um, we don't really get a clear accounting of it. There seems to be fuzzy logic applied, um, the whole east-west thing. Um, it would be nice to get a regular accounting of funds and money, like putting the treasurer back on the, on the re month, at least once a meeting, once a month, have our treasurer report, or give us a detailed report of funds and how this money is being spent. Because um, we're talking millions of dollars, and we have no proof, no confidence that that money's even there for our policemen and our firemen and our kids. Um, so I really would like to see, and I don't know if that's a right to know request or if it's something that you guys can present to us, some way to like give us some faith back. We're trying to you know, have confidence and faith in the, in the whole process, but it's very hard from where we stand. Um, the other thing is there's a resolution on here that I don't quite get the gist of. It's you you're wanna change the rules of decorum. Um, you've already changed them once this year without a resolution. So I don't understand why a resolution is needed um, and, and it, call me paranoid, it leads me to believe there's an ulterior motive behind it, that there must be something there that you're trying to push through that's going to prevent people from speaking or give people a, um, a voice. Um, so I don't understand why it has to be a resolution now when it wasn't a resolution on January 17th when, we added, when you added in that the president had the ability to kick people out or not to ask them to be removed. The other thing that's on here, um, or I notice, if this is to replace what the whole intent of the Home Rule Charter and what's happened, um, I do notice that you did take off the piece about um, losing our time when we ask a question. So if I'm all in favor if you're going to keep that part in. So if we can keep talking, you know, if I ask a question now and it takes you four minutes, I still get my time back. Because you didn't specify that if you're trying to change the rest of it. Um, I just see it seems like a pointless resolution unless you're trying to pull one over on us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, tonight, I'm going to address that tonight when we go over the resolution, okay? Thank you. Um, next is David Heyman. Uh, David Heyman, 727 Stanbridge Road. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mayor Brown uh, for inviting me into his office uh, last Friday for a conversation. It was uh, not nothing about policy. It was about getting to know each other. Uh, I came out of there with a very, very uh, uh, warm feeling, and uh, I'm encouraged, and, and uh, I look forward to a, a good working relationship uh, with your administration. Um, also uh, uh, met, uh, uh, just met Mr. Jones. I'm gonna be reaching out uh, to also have a similar meeting with you and look forward to, forward to talking to you. So our money, uh, 
we have a total of $61.8 million uh, amongst the various accounts. Um, our unrestricted general funds, this is, the, oh, so I'm sorry, this is the close of January 2024, so it does not include February. So at the end of January, we have $13 million uh, in the unrestricted general funds account. The ARPA funds uh, accounts have about $28.8 million. And then the other large holding is the Capital Projects Fund with $15.5 million. Um, and then there's some other funds spread out in, in, in other accounts. Um, regarding, real quick, uh, the, the ARPA, uh, it earned $128,000 in interest in January. Uh, and since we received the money back in 2021, $2.271 million. Uh, it was interest, and that goes into the general fund for operating expenses. Um, we are working on a $88.7 million uh, budget. Uh, of that, uh, $58 million of it uh, is, comes from real estate taxes of various sources, the current uh, late, late taxes, fees, and so on. So that's 65% of our budget uh, we are dependent on uh, in terms of uh, just property taxes. Um, it's been recognized that that's an issue that will be dealt with at some point. Uh, as of the end of January, uh, we have expended about 8.3 of our annual budget, keeping in mind that one month is 8% of the entire year, so that, that tracks very nicely. We don't get a lot of revenue in, 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 in January. Um, we should be starting to receive revenue in March through the collection of the property taxes. Um, let me see. I think that is it. I'm going to skip the ARPA fund because I had a little trouble with it, and I thank Diane uh, for getting me uh, reconciled with the ARPA fund. I was I was lost in the numbers and couldn't find my way, so I don't want to try to present on it and make any misstatements. I'll be back with the uh, ARPA summary uh, next month. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next is John DeMassey. Good evening. If you, say, if you say you are for listening to the residents and their freedom of speech, you do not try and restrict speaking time to the bare customary minimum. You do not try to redefine the words of the Home Rule Charter because it suits your goals. You create opportunities for concerned persons to speak up. The three minute time is not a mandatory maximum, it is a customary time amount. People in power who work to limit speech do so out of weakness and fear. They are not strong enough to answer the difficult questions, and they are afraid of what might be said when they cannot control the messaging. Is allowing the people to speak a detriment to the community, or is allowing them to speak a problem for you? Of what are you afraid? What are the people going to say that you do not want to hear? If you say you are for transparency, you do not work to restrict responses to right to know requests. The right to know exceptions are permitted reasons to deny our request, but they are not legal requirements. This township should be more forthcoming, and it could be if it wanted to be. But you only do the bare minimum, so do not say that you are for transparency if you are checking a box doing the bare minimum. This administration has done what it can to avoid compliance with the law instead of doing what it can in accordance with the Home Rule Charter and past ordinances. We've seen things like land grabs, money gra grabs, and hidden votes that are called polling, which is not a thing under the law. It's just one of many new inventions that don't exist anywhere except when you want to make the law what you want it to be and then you want to spend the people's money the way you want to, not the way ordinances are written. Last week, we witnessed an embarrassing display. There's no other way of describing that from the solicitor on an ordinance and the definition of what an address was. Based on the solicitor's definition, if I get a permit for a fence on my property and you say I can go north of 706 Stanbridge to the edge, southern edge of 708 Stanbridge, I'm going to go to my neighbors and fence them in too because they touch my boundaries, and that apparently is the way the township looks at boundaries. And if you stand up to this administration or the township, you are tried to, the 
The council, the members will try to beat you down. I've been called dishonest, fraudulent, and corrupt by people like Ms. Billups. And that was just for standing up for my community. And you've done worse to Richard Bly, who has done a hell of a lot more than I have for this community. Thank you. Next is Jean Kosha. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jean Kosha. I live at 7216 Brant Road. I would like to say, uh, to first say, I'm speaking as a resident. I happen to be a library employee, and I will speak about my concerns about the lack of sufficient funding for the library, but I want to be clear. I'm not speaking on behalf of the library. Uh, the, I'm not speaking on behalf of the library administration or the library board. My concern is that the library has, has been underfunded for decades, resulting in staff that are underpaid and buildings that are not maintained. Starting wages for desk staff are currently $13 an hour and rarely go higher. Full-time staff have had wages cut through policy changes regarding insurance. I have raised the issue of low wages for library staff to the previous two library directors and our current director. The response has always been, we don't have the funds to pay staff more. While the library gets some funding from the state, the majority of the funding is from the township. That is why I'm bringing this to your attention. You may ask, what do staff members do? They help community members to apply for jobs, apply for housing, find resources, gain computer skills, print, scan, and attach documents, fill out online forms, and of course, check out books, access our free eBooks, music and movies, reserve free museum passes, and use other resources the library has available for free. I refer to the municipal branch where I work as the little engine that could. We are small in terms of space, but we serve hundreds of people every day. Our staff are incredibly hardworking and passionate about serving the public. I reached out to the township through a right to know request to find out what the wages are for township employees. I thought maybe our wages are comparable and this is just what the going rate is. It turns out that town township employees who are doing similar jobs to our desk staff earn 30 to $34 on average per hour. That is more than twice what library staff earn. Why are library workers so undervalued? They provide an incredible service to this community, and I would ask that you look at the funding formula that you use for the library. While all of the people I work with at the library love what they do and find great joy in helping people achieve their goals, we all have bills to pay and certainly deserve a living wage. $13 an hour is not a living wage. We can and we must do better. Library workers serve the entire public. We serve all ages, all socioeconomic levels, housed or unhoused, documented or undocumented. We serve everyone. The library is the one place in the community where people of all ages, backgrounds, ethnicities, and religious beliefs congregate and cross paths. We are an amazing institution. To serve so many people with so many differing Thank needs you. takes a talented Ms. staff, Kosher. which we have. Please, I would ask you to learn about what we do, see the value in our work, and set a budget for the library that provides wages for all its workers that is fair and just. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kosher. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Brown. I wanna, just want to address that. You, you did bring that to my attention. We had a conversation at an event, so I'm well aware of your, your very valid concerns, and I'll share those with uh, our CAO, and you know we'll we'll have a follow up conversation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Secretary Billups. Next, we have approval of the minutes from. I'm sorry. Um, on the agenda, should say December sixth, twenty twenty three. Um. Make a motion to approve. There's a motion on the floor to approve. Yes, Councillor. So um, there's a motion on the floor um, by uh, Councillor uh, Blackwell. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, second made by um, Vice President Heyman. Councillor, so if we could just speak in the microphone just so people at home can hear you. Um, is there any, any discussion on the minutes? 
Seeing none, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, approval of the minutes is passed. Next, we have the Honorable Mayor Ed Brown. Thank you. Good evening, President Tunis, Vice President Heyman, uh, Council, Administration, and the public. I'd like to start by saying how happy I am that Mr. Crandall Jones is our CAO. After only three weeks, it is clear that I made a wise choice in selecting a comprehensive and natural leader who has already added value to our organization and improving a number of things. His thorough review of the township's operations, including all departments, personnel, finances, processes, procedures, continues, and we will soon share the immediate, short-term, and long-term priorities for the township, as I've mentioned at previous meetings. I would also like to share with the public that I was invited on Monday to Harrisburg, specifically to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and the Pennsylvania State House, uh, the Pennsylvania State Senate, where I was acknowledged on both the floor of the House and Senate for becoming the first black mayor of Upper Darby Township. It was an honor being recognized on those hallowed grounds and it was a day that I will not soon forget. I would like to thank state reps, Gina H. Curry and Heather Boyd for planning and setting up the day and to House Speaker McClinton, Joanna McClinton, for her kind words and recognizing me during the session. A special thanks to Senator Tim Kearney who gave an eloquent speech about all aspects of my life, including my family, my service to the community, serving on the school board, my service as a member of Men of Action Brothers of Faith, my work in corporate America, and as the mayor of Upper Darby Township. It became emotional for me when Senator Kearney spoke about the life that I built with my queen in heaven, Sherita. Senator Anthony Williams also had very kind words to say about me regarding my role as a member of the Delaware County Black Caucus, and also decided to share with the rest of the Senate which football team I root for. <laughs> I'd like to thank CAO Jones for being gracious enough to accompany me to Harrisburg on Monday and spend the day with me. Crandall, Gina, Heather, and I had the opportunity to speak with the Appropriations Committee Chair, Representative Jordan Harris, who listened very intently as we laid out the vision for Upper Darby and the cost associated with some of the short-term and long-term plans. He agreed to help us and planned a meeting in the next few weeks to solidify the plan of support moving forward. At one of our meetings in January, I promised to provide council and the community with as much information as possible about the township administration and operations. I vowed to invite each of the department heads now under Crandall's guidance to a council meeting to brief council and the public. You already in, previously, uh, you already in previous months heard from the fire commissioner and the police superintendent. Tonight you will hear from Joe Martin, our director of public works, who was responsible for a very complex operation where he'll share information and details about what he and the rest of the team does. Joe? I'd like to thank you the mayor. Come up here, Joe, and you can sit and you can face the public and you can be comfortable. I would like to start by thanking Mayor Brown and Council for letting me speak on Public Works' behalf. Um, I'm just going to give a short narrative of what Public Works does. It's a big department, so um, in your folders you'll see there's um, a more complex um, sheet of what we do for Public Works in Public Works. Our mission is to provide the residents of Upper Darby with municipal services that they expect deserve, and enhance the quality of their lives. Our goal is to provide the services knowledgeable, dedicated, and in a courtesy, fa courtesy, courtesy of fashion, and as efficiently as a possible. Public Works is a 24 hours, seven day week operation. We are the second largest department behind the police with 130 plus employees. As a director, I have a support of five foremen four assistants, and three office staff members. There are nine divisions in public works. They are sanitation, highway, sewer, construction, street cleaning, electrical, paint and signs, parks maintenance, 
and vehicle maintenance. We'll start with the biggest one, sanitation. And annually, we do 31,000 tons of trash and 3,700 tons of recycling. We service 30,000 households a week. In highway, we maintain 122 miles of road. That's over 600 streets in Upper Darby. When it snows, highway is the center of our snow removal. Uh, sewer maintenance, we, we repair miles of sanitary and storm lines in the township and our dedicated crew is on call 24 hours a day for any sewer backups or emergencies. Construction crew maintain all township buildings. Sewer clean, uh, street cleaning, uh, we sweep, street, sweep our township streets and they provide in the fall for leaf collection. Electrical has 121 signalized in intersections and over 4,500 streetlights they maintain. Paint and Signs is responsible for all signs in the township and street markings. Um, parks maintenance is, we have 27 base, uh, playgrounds and 30 athletic fields that they maintain. Vehicle maintenance keeps over 200 vehicles on the road. That includes police and some fire equipment. Um, that's, that covers the divisions. We all talked about the one center. Someone brought it up today. Um, the number is 610-734-7625. We work in your neighborhoods, but you guys need to report stuff to us. You know, we, we can't see everything. If you report it, we'll, we'll try to get to it. Um, I took down Tobacco Lane. I'll look at that tomorrow. Um, on the township website, I just want to put that. It's www.upperdarby.org. Next week's a four-day week, so any four-day weeks, please look at the holiday schedule for the townships. It's different than the holiday schedules for a lot of people, and your trash and your recycling change. We get a lot of calls on four-day weeks. Um, we work with a bunch of civic groups throughout the town. If you do a cleanup or you need help, please call us. If you do a cleanup, we'll come out and pick up the trash for the next business day. Or you gather it up, you tell us where it is, and we'll come get it. Um, and last but not least, March is Women's Appreciation Month, and I would like to thank the women in public works, Gina, Paige, and Karen, and the recently retired Peggy. Um, to me, they're the backbone of public works, so without them, I couldn't do anything. Um, thanks for your time tonight. Joe, thank you for your work. Uh, you gave me quite an education when I was uh, after I became after I was sworn in and you gave me a tour and I appreciate all the information. We've had several meetings since I've been sworn in and you've always given me an education and, and what public work entails. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Lastly, I'd like to remind the public that on Thursday, March 21st, tomorrow, at 9.30 a.m., the Upper Darby School District will be hosting a public school education funding press conference where Dr. McGarry will talk about the impact of our district of the state budget proposal on its budget planning and funding for education. Since the district and township are connected in many ways, since we serve the same clientele, I thought it would be prudent to mention it tonight. I highly recommend attending. I know I will be there. Thank you, President Tunis and Council. That completes my mayor's message. Uh, thank you, Mayor Brown. Next, the President, Council. Um, just want to make the public aware today at 6.30 p.m., we held an executive session to discuss matters related to litigation. Um, on tonight's agenda, you will find Resolution 0624. This resolution is designed to formalize our meeting rules and decorum. Historically, we have many policies and a lot of them are unwritten and this resolution provides us with an opportunity to establish clear ground rules for our meetings. I want to emphasize that this will not impede residents' opportunity to publicly speak. Rather, it will help ensure meetings run smoothly and effectively. Our chief municipal clerk, Catherine K. Doggett, um, has started and she's getting onboarded. Um, she's currently working on compiling minutes from the last 13 council meetings, some of who include from last year. Um, I kindly ask all council members to extend uh, their patience and support as Kate works on these tasks. Additionally, uh, Kay is also catching up on outstanding invoices from the previous uh, year, as well as uh, various other administrative tasks. Uh, I have been collaborating with our Chief Municipal Clerk, Kate, 
and um, Mayor Ed Brown's administration um, to streamline processes and make the council agenda process more effective for all parties involved. Generally, the process we have now um, takes a lot of time and um, in the age of technology, we can definitely speed those things up. So I'm excited to work um, with CAO Jones of Mayor Ed Brown's administration and the chief municipal clerk um, on, on this. Um, our next council meeting is scheduled for April 3rd, 2024 at 7 p.m. held at 100 Garrett Road. Hope to see you all there. That concludes my report. Um, next on the agenda is the committee reports, the Law and Government and Rules and Procedures Committee. Uh, we have- um, The CAO's CAO. report, CAO. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> CAO uh, Crandall Jones, I apologize. Thank you, Mr. President, and good evening, uh, Mayor and Council members. I did turn it up. Bring it a little okay. closer to you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President, and, and uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Thank you as well. Uh, the item uh, resolution 624 is a resolution of the township uh, that authorizes the submission of an application for funding from the statewide share account grant of up to $1 million for Upper Darby's pedestrian bridge safety development project. Uh, Council, this resolution is, is a housekeeping resolution in that uh, the, the council already approved application for its grant uh, last fall. Uh, and certainly since that time, there's been a change in the administration. And as the uh, grantor now is going through the process of setting up the grant uh, for the municipality, one of the things that was asked, uh, who are the new signers uh, for this grant? Uh, and so um, as, as just a uh, housekeeping administrative matter, we put this forward because uh, time is of the essence now. They're, they're looking to submit uh, emails to myself, uh, the mayor, uh, so that we can really initiate the process uh, if and when a grant is awarded. And that's what this, what this does. Uh, again, it is for the pedestrian uh, bridge uh, project. Hopefully we'll get a million dollars. Uh, for that, but whatever amount of money we'll get, we certainly will be forthcoming uh, as soon as we get grant notification to let you know uh, what's uh, what's happening. Um, that is uh, the purpose of this, and so we seek uh, a um, motion from the council to uh, appoint the mayor and myself as the signers of all documents. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. A uh, motion made by Councilor Blackwell, seconded by Councilor Wagner. I have a question. Um, is there any counselors that have any discussion? Councilor Wentz? I'm just curious, does the finance department have all the f information in reference to this grant? Yes, they, they, they do not, we do not yet have the actual grant uh, award or any of the notification materials because that won't come. But as far as the information to submit to the grant, the very fact that the state is contacting us now for- No, does Upper Darby Finance Department have the paperwork that's Diane no does yes okay absolutely I I'm asking because there have been many grants in the past where the finance department was not included and did not get the information so well, I just want to that's a great correct question. it and make sure that because they have to you know deal with everything with it they need to know that's a great question that is, is one I've already been on in every grant that we do going forward Finance will be involved in it. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Is there any further discussion from council members? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, the next item, council, is resolution 7 24. Uh, to authorize the disposition of certain uh, public records uh, in following the procedures for it set forth in the municipal records manual, which is also subject to state uh, record, municipal records law. And the request of council is to allow the destruction of records that are essentially uh, <clears throat> have not been deemed as records uh, that should be retained. Uh, by the municipality. There's a separate process 
for destruction if the records are supposed to be retained. These records, we did not deem them as worthy of being retained. I am working my way through this. So I, I'd like to share with council uh, the records that we're talking about. So first, there are routine correspondence that have no administrative value, and we do have digital files related to those. Uh, the second is ethics commission statements of financial interest. They're 2018 and older, and there's one box of those files. Uh, next is municipal lien files satisfied <coughs> prior to 2020 and associated CDBG program files no, long, no longer re being required that we hold them by the HUD uh, retention schedule. There are 69, 69 boxes of those. Uh, we also have next right to know requests from 2021 and older, uh, five boxes and digital files. Uh, five is account payable files, files and ledgers that are 2016 and older, eight boxes. And finally, accounts receivable files and ledgers 2016 and older, and we just have a portion of one box of those records. And the <clears throat> ask is uh, approval to destroy. I'll make, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second resolution 724. All right, motion made by Councilor Blackwell, seconded by uh, Vice President Heyman. Um, there's any discussion? Mm -hmm. Councilor Wagner? Briefly. Mr. Jones, can I just ask you one question? Sure. Um, and this is no reflection on you or um, you weren't here when I've had this issue in the past. Um, are any, have any of those documents been uploaded or scanned into any kind of database? No. Okay. To, to my knowledge, no. Okay. Um, and again, you wouldn't know this, but that's what my issue has been in the past is that I know that there, um, I mean, that's very basic technology to do that. Um, so I'm obviously a no on this motion tonight. Uh, Councilor Wentz. So, um, I'm a little concerned with 69 boxes of HUD documents. Is HUD aware? I know you're following their schedule, but does HUD know that 69 boxes worth of their information is going to be destroyed if this is passed? Yes. Okay. And and I just for the for the sake of councils and and, and certainly for the public, this is a pretty routine process that normally happens in every government, uh, including the federal government for destruction, state government for destruction of records. At some point, uh, it just becomes a fire hazard, a space hazard. Nobody has the ability to keep all of the records. And once on the, uh, the state deems it uh, appropriate to the, destroy those records, and we, all, we have a schedule that the state gives us in terms of when it's appropriate to destroy those records. Once the state says they can, we can destroy those records, it's the only time that those records uh, have, to be, uh, have to be destroyed. I will tell you also, you know, and I think that's a great point in terms of a scanning project. And I, I did a scanning project over the last three years uh, in my prior, uh, in, in, in Norristown. And I had to allocate about $75,000 each year for that scanning project. Uh, so if that is something uh, as we go forward, that certainly in doing the budget process that council's willing to discuss, discuss, I'm absolutely happy to have that discussion about what we've done. Yeah, I mean, I think scanning is important. I just think that that's a whole lot of information all at once. And I'm, you know, uh, that's, that's a lot of information. Um, and I'm concerned that there are things in there that we might need later. Um, and since we don't see the boxes, we don't really know exactly what's in there. Understood. And I, I'll, I'll say, and, and I think the solicitor uh, could, could share uh, this as well. You know, once the state deems it uh, unnecessary information to have, honestly, from a legal standpoint, once they, they do that, it's probably best that you do destroy them. Uh, because the amount, again, the, the, if, particularly if you don't have any electronic records, the amount of time and, and, and uh, cost invested for records that you don't need and that you might have to search for that you're not required by law to search for, uh, you know, is, is, is 
from a practical standpoint, uh, not a good use of, of municipal staff time. And, and there's, no, there's no legal value to them if the state has, uh, has designated them for eligible for destruction. Right, but you don't have it scanned in, so you don't have any other copy of those documents. So if something comes up or someone appeals something or anything comes back, you have nothing to support the, what the township did. What you have, though, is the fact that you've gone according to state records retention law, and that, that vindicates the, the municipality because you've, you've actually gone by the law. So it's, it is fine that at some point, uh, according to the uh, Records uh, Destruction Act, it is fine at some point that you can say, per the, we followed the procedure per, per Records Destruction Act, we don't have those records, and there's no negative to that. You followed the act. And so there's, there's no legal comeback to say you don't have the records. If, if we've destroyed records that we were mandated to retain, that's when you have uh, a legal issue. Okay, uh, just one thing I, I want to say, um, CAO Jones, that um, this is routine. It's just something I would support. Um, I think the timing um, gives us a great opportunity to save some money by shredding it at State Rep Boyd's and State Rep Curry's event uh, this weekend. In the past, we've had this discussion. Council members expressed that they wanted to go through every box. They did not go through every box, and it held up um, just time, and it's taken up office space. Some of these documents were only required to keep for five years. So it's, it's just different things like that. And from, I agree from a practical standpoint, I think this is the, the best solution. Uh, Councillor Wagner? I just wanted to follow up on what I by no means think you should keep all of these boxes. That That's by no means, that's right. very archaic, and I, I don't believe that. My issue is that we do have the technology, and I do, coming from my legal perspective, I always keep everything in every one of my cases. Um, and the way we do it is through scanning. So I just think it's always the best practice. And I understand what you're saying, that we would never be held to... Um, a, uh, a legal issue for destroying them. I just am of the mind that the scanning process is better. So I'm not suggesting by any means that um, we should keep all of those boxes in the building. I, I support, fully support digitizing records and, and moving forward, absolutely, I do. I think it's the thing to do. Uh, Councilor Vance, then Councilor Silver. Um, oh, did you wanna go first? I guess he called you first. Sure. But, oh, thank you. Um, okay, so item one, AL1, uh, it states digital files at the end of the line. And then item four, AL46, it states digital files at the end of the line. Are they digital files that are retained from this, or are they digital files that will be destroyed it's old as media. part of this? It's old media that, that you know, like floppy disks and, and whatever that old media digital files are, that's what it is. It's, it's no longer of any base. It's the same records on old media. Oh, okay. Yes. But it's like no longer a supportable media or whatever. Uh, yes, for the okay. most part. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, Councillor Vanta? So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So for the listening public, uh, I'm assuming, CEO, that uh, the documents are reviewed and we meet every requirement to do that, right? Yes, there's a manual, uh, a state manual, and there's a municipal manual that documents both which records are eligible and how they're, how they're to be handled. And we track those records that we have uh, to say they've met the schedule. And as we're looking at them, for instance, if they're finance records or planning records or HUD records, as, as I said, HUD also has a, a, a manual that says you can, you can throw our stuff away at this point. We, we evaluate that against all of those, all of those destruction schedules and if, they're, if they are valid to those destruction schedules, then they, they're put in the list to be destroyed and brought before council. Okay, so definitely we are not gonna be at a point where, oh, I need to check something out. <laughs> but anyway, if that is the case. Somebody might I, come back and say, I'd like to see a 2016 invoice from something and we'll say, well, per this destruction schedule, we, we destroyed it and, and that's, Perfectly legitimate response. If that is a kid, then I support a shred. Uh, Councillor Minnick. Yeah, for me, it's a no-brainer. The state says it's okay. In your past, in, in your past career at Norristown, 
you said during the scanning process cost, did you say $75,000? One, you have to draw the line in the sand as to how far back you're going to digitize. And that's going to that's going to also contain the cost uh, in terms of how far back you're going to digitize. And then it's a, a cultural change for the organization as well, because then you have to get into everybody into the habit of not creating all of this paper in, in the first place. And the culture part of it is, is probably tougher than the, the records digitization. Yes, we should sh shred the boxes on Saturday, all of them. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Wentz? Um, I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, for the shredding event itself on Saturday, that's meant for the residents of the, of the districts of the state reps, right? So for the township to bring over a hundred boxes to be shredded, isn't that going to occupy far more space and allow and reduce the amount of residents that would be able to shred their own documents? It's it's a I've been I've been at many of those events. I've, I've helped with it for state reps. Yes, state and reps. but and there are many people that are still in line once the trucks are full. Um, these are. This is a lot of boxes. If residents are only allowed one or two boxes per per vehicle, and then the township's bringing over 100 boxes, or at least 100 boxes, that's a huge dent into their, um, into the township's abil residents' ability to shred stuff. Just an observation. Uh, uh, Councilor Brannis? So um, considering that I'm a part of this event, um, and I was a part of the event last year when it was a different representative. Um, and Upper Darby has always been welcome. Upper Darby Township has always been welcome to come to the event um, beforehand so it doesn't interfere with the other residents who are coming through. And as far as the number of boxes, um, it's already squared away where we already have that accessibility for the township to do it. Great, thank you for the clarification. Uh, President Tunis, I, I'd like to call the question, if we can. Can I get a second? It's a motion to call the question. Second. Second. Okay. Is there a motion to second to call the question? Is there any dis discussion on calling the question? Okay. Uh, I just had a question, but I can ask any. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to. Okay. Can we, um, can we, uh, do you just want to do a roll call vote on calling the question? Or this is a roll call vote on calling the question. Um, roll call vote on calling the question. Um, Vice President Heyman? Yes. Uh, Secretary, Bill I'm sorry. Secretary Billups is a yes. Councilor Minnick? Yes. Councilor Wagner? Yes. President Tunis? Yes. Councilor Banto? Yes. Uh, sorry, Councilor Brandis? Yes. Councilor Andrusco? Yes. Councilor Wentz? Yes. Councilor Silva? Yes. Councilor Blackwell? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, now we have the motion um, and second the motion for resolution 724 um, to authorize the, the deposition of certain public records following the procedures set forth in the municipal records manual. Uh, can I have a roll call vote for that, uh, Secretary Billups? Um, so, uh, uh, Pres Vice President Heyman? Yes. Secretary Billups is a yes. Councilor Billups? Uh, mm. Councilor Minnick? Yes. Councilor Wagner? No. President Tunis? Yes. Councilor Banto? Yes. Councilor Brandis? Yes. Councilor Andrusco? Yes. Councilor Wentz? No. Councilor Silva? Yes. Councilor Blackwell? Yes. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two. 
Okay, the resolution passes 9-2. do apologize to the public. I got a little bit ahead of myself and I went through my report already. <laughs> Um, so I'm sorry. Uh, next on the agenda we have is the, the committee report. Uh, and we have the Long Government and Rules and Procedural Committee. Uh, Councilor Branis. Thank you, President Tunis. Um, so since it came up during public forum, um, I do want you to know that this is not a resolution to silence everybody. Um, just to let you know, that is never my intention. I believe in free speech. If you guys know anything about me, and some of you out there do, I say a lot of stuff. All right, so there is no discrepancy in that. The uh, committee had gotten together, um, minus uh, Councilor Wagner was not able to attend, um, but this is simply just putting down and making legit rules of decorum. And here's why we like to do this. First of all, it makes the meetings efficient and constructive for all of us. You know, today I heard people say that we needed to work as a team. Well, this is part of it. Um, also, we want to make sure that, you know, all of our behaviors are checked because when, I mean, I know when I get heightened, things are going to fly out. When people here get heightened, things fly out and it doesn't help the process. Um, you know, we kind of need to, to act like adults in order to get things done. Um, but finally, one of the biggest things is that originally when the rules of decorum are read by President Tunis at the beginning of the meeting, um, it does say that, you know, when it comes to the discretion of removing somebody after a verbal warning, you know, that's, um, you know, uh, uh, deemed by President Tunis. But in his absence, we wanted to make sure that we listed the vice president as having that power. And if they're not here to conduct the meeting, then it's the majority vote of the council. And that goes for not only us, but in future administrations too, but it's a way to make sure that we are all communicating and everything is calm and we can all get together and get the work done. Okay, so um, do I have any discussion from the committee or any of the council members? I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 8-24. Second. Our motion made by uh, Vice President Heyman, seconded by Councillor Blackwell. Is there any discussion on this resolution? Let's start with Councillor Silva. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate the explanation. I, I even, I, I get the understanding of, you know, you're trying to create a calm workspace or what have you that we can all conduct business in. However, I just feel like the idea that we can legislate calm is not really, it's not realistic. And I also feel like I can understand the public's concern. I understand my own concern as well. We, you know, when someone is removed from these meetings, I believe that's a misdemeanor, right? I mean, that's that's a very heavy-handed um, slap on the wrist, for what it's worth. Right. And and it and it is not. It shouldn't just be doled out because it would be more convenient to have a calm I get place. That. And and there are things that we do here, mm -hmm. and I know you know having been here for some time that do raise public ire, do get public concern one way or the other. And I, I don't feel like we can legislate emotional output from right. people. And I don't think it's a plausible idea. And I feel like it's, we're, we're, and we are limiting people's ability to share their concerns for the fear that they may not be able to maintain their emotional output in a way that would be in accordance with this. Now, and, so and for you... that reason, I feel like I am against this change. And I am concerned too that this change already seems like it's happened, um, and it has happened for like the last few months, and you know, and now we're we're approving it, which honestly feels strange and peculiar. Um, Councilman Silva, can I just ask a question? I, I listen to you intently. Um, is is there a line, in your opinion, of? Um, where someone steps over the line as far as their behavior. Is there, I mean, because if they step over the line, I mean, people can be emotional, right? Um, and, and express their satisfaction or dissatisfaction with things we legislate or, or decisions we make. But my question to you is, after listening to you, I have to ask, is there a line? Because based on what you said, it, it doesn't, I don't think I heard one because I think there, in, in my humble opinion, there's a line that you can cross where it's, beyond just showing emotion for something you don't agree with and now you're being disruptive to the proceedings and it's no longer productive. So my question to you is, 
is there a line, you know, in your opinion at all that people can can possibly cross uh, in their behavior? I mean, if anyone threw a rock at me, I'd be pretty upset. But that's, you know, that's the extent of your line, a rock being thrown at you. Other than that, depends on the size of the rock. Um, but it, it's it's um, okay. it's I you know I to be fair, it you know it where you may draw the line or where I may draw the line may differ as well. Clearly, and, clearly. And, but I was asking, is there a line in your opinion? I'm asking, is there a line? And if there is a line, I'm just curious to know where your line is. Like you said, our lines may be totally different. Like you may have a higher tolerance for disruptions than I do or someone else. So I'm asking, is there a line? And I'm just trying to get a feel for if I, where your line is. I feel, though, I mean, while that's a valid question, I, I, we are up here representing the public. We are here representing the residents of this township. No doubt. And it's... I feel like it's their place to determine what that line is. I've sat up here and been called many things, but even some of you, to be honest, to be fair. So it's not um, some of the things were hurtful. Some of the things in my mind were dishonest, but it's not my place to argue with a resident's opinion. A resident is welcome to have whatever opinion they do. And it is, and while you're right. I mean, maybe we should determine that there's some kind of line or not determine a line. I, it, they have a right to express their emotion, their dissatisfaction, their satisfaction. They have a right to share with us. I mean, you, you want to limit the, the three minute thing. I think that's, I sure that's fair. Like you can't have people just come up here and speak for 20 minutes about whatever they feel like. I mean, there is sort of a sense of, discernment that things should have some relevance to the conductance of the meeting and not just, you know, people come up here and read out of the phone book or something. Though I guess that's their right too, if they want to do that for three minutes. But the reality is, is that it's not for me to decide what the line is. I mean, I just don't feel like that's my place. I don't feel like that's this body's place to determine what reaction from the public is okay or not okay. Uh, one second. Councillor Wagner? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to follow that up. Um, I'm assuming I'll get the same answer, uh, question from you. I do think that there's a line. Um, but I can tell you that not only have I taken constitutional law, I also taught constitutional law at the police academy. I think the Constitution provides that line, is what is where I find it. Um, <laughs> I think threats are certainly beyond the line. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the adage that everyone yells is that you, you can't yell fire in a, in a theater, that kind of thing. I think that's when it goes too far. I agree um, with Councilman Silva. I've been called awful things up here, terrible, awful things, some things that are so bad I won't even repeat them up here from that podium by some members of this council who were not on council at the time. And I'm the one sitting here saying that, I do not believe that this is appropriate. And I do believe it's a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, I, I, I think my colleagues um, are either, their interpretation is a little bit different from mine. Um, this has nothing to do with people being able to speak at meetings. People, everyone has three minutes. People say things, I let people say things that are not allowed based on a decorum, right? They get their three minutes. This becomes when you're not at the microphone, when we're trying to conduct business and people are yelling out. It's very similar to school. In school, you don't talk unless you're called on. It's just, you, you do not speak unless you're called on in school. And if you don't, I, I, everyone had the opportunity to speak. It's hard for people at home to hear. But if you don't have the microphone, everyone should be able to hear that constituent speak. That's a very simple ask, I feel like. And, I'm not, we're not trying to limit people's free speech. People say things, they can say all types of things, just like you've been called names. I've been called everything too. We've all been, but that's not what we're limiting. We're not stopping people from saying that. We're, what we're trying to do is make sure we have an environment where it's cohesive and we're getting things done. People aren't just yelling out and screaming things in the audience. It's not productive for uh, township council business. Uh, uh, one, one final thing. Thing. And if you think about it, and, and Megan, you would know this, when you are in a court of law, there is a certain behavior 
that should be demonstrated. When you are on the House floor or in the gallery, there should be one. I mean, it's, it's no different. And we're not saying don't speak your mind. I am all for speaking your mind. I am all for it. I am not saying that, you know, people don't have a right to express their emotions or be in an emotional state. But I do understand what all of you are saying, and I also understand what President Tunis is saying. All I want is to make sure, like you said, people get heard. Now, if there is talking disruption in the back when you are not at the microphone, it's hard to hear. And if we're all supposed to work together and hear what everybody has to say, we can't do that in that type of moment. And again, this also allows us to make sure, and I, and I have a line too. You know, I understand the line question that Mayor Brown has discussed because like for me, it's like, if it's like seriously threatening, then that's a line, you know? Like I, I, have, I have a lot of tolerance. So that's not a big deal to me. I also think about it this way. You know, this is on YouTube. Kids are watching this. When you have people swearing or yelling, sometimes that's not necessarily a, a good thing to sh demonstrate as an adult in a public setting. Now, I mean, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just because I was a teacher and I didn't expect that in my classroom. But I think as adults, we should all be able to not only voice ourselves and share our emotional states if we get fired up, that's fine, but not do it in a way that's going to be disruptive or even harmful to people out here. You know, because if somebody's getting all, you know, flustered and, and you know, and screaming threats, they're sitting out there, they could hurt any one of you. And I don't want to see that happen. You never know what can knock people over an edge. And that is not fair to the residents who come here, who deserve to be safe in this room as well as us. Well, Bill Wentz, I'm sorry. Councilor Wentz. Thank you. Um, so one of my concerns is um, the residents read uh, sections of the Home Rule Charter in previous meetings. And one, in one of the sections, it says um, for you know those who can speak at council meetings, is concerned persons. Now, residents might actually have been put in originally way back when in 2020 when we originally, I think we passed an ordinance then, I couldn't find it, but I know that we had made rules of decorum back then when I was president. And I know that resident was something that was important to me because so many documents within the township would say citizens. And because we are a refugee hub, not all of our residents are citizens and that would eliminate them. But I also hadn't read far enough into the Home Rules Charter to find the concerns person part of the equation. Um, concerned person includes business owners where resident doesn't, because a business owner may not live in the township, but their business is in our township. It's a property that they own or, they, or a, a property that they rent and they have their business here. This excludes them from being able to speak. I think that's a huge problem. Um, I, you know, that's, I mean, I think we need to use the Home Rule Charter's term so that all business owners can participate in our council meetings. Um, because if we isolate them, they're the ones who are, they're paying taxes too. They're contributing to this township. Um, they should have a say in what happens here, especially when it's things that directly affect them. Um, so I don't think, I think we need to change residents to concerned persons. Person, persons is what it was in the Home Rule Charter. Solicitor Kilkenny. Uh, business owners have the right to speak at a public meeting of a municipality. Uh, the state open meetings law says that when it talks about residents, that includes business owners. Um, so I think that's, that's clear. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that I certainly have no, by asking my question, because uh, I, I definitely have a line, right? But um, I certainly support anybody standing at that podium, as long as it's not a threat or personal attack, to say whatever they want, whether it's a compliment, whether it's criticism, um, whatever they want. I, I certainly support that, and I would never comment or criticize anybody expressing their opinion at the podium. Um, sometimes things are expressed uh, away from the podium, as you mentioned, where it stops the proceedings up here. And I think that's what you're trying to address, where someone is disruptive because they don't like something they heard and they're not standing at the podium, but there's someone in it somewhere in the audience, but they feel the need to uh, 
you know, shout out or express their opinion with no uh, restraint um, to the proceedings that's going on. So that's it. Okay. We've been on this conversation for a while. She's going to do a couple of folks that haven't spoken yet. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bento. Yeah. So thank you, President Tony. Um, I think everyone so far have, you know, said all, but uh, the thing here is, and as I always put it, I, for me, I appreciate all of you that are sitting here, the fact that you make time to be here, I mean, it's a plug because we need people in here to have conversation with council. Um, but honestly speaking, I just rightly pull it, this thing is air live. Children are washing with parents at home. And we are sitting here as adults and not really understanding that, oh, what we are doing here, it has some effect on people outside of here in our community. But for me, looking at this, I don't think putting rules in place, it is bad at all. It's just that when, you know, I mean, it's fortunate that we are at this level. But again, these are just rules to remind people that when you come here, we have to have conversation about this township, things that are matter to us, things that are affecting us, and we can do it together. So again, I, um, I'm for this. We, we just have to use it as a reminder. And it is sad that you're going to remind adults, but I feel it's not a bad thing that when you are beyond this, you, be, you will remind yourself, oh, I think I'm going too far. So, President Tony, that, that's what I just want to touch on. Thank you, uh, Councilor Bento. President Heyman? I just want to comment, and I don't want to rehash too many things other members have said. Uh, other members have made comments that I think cover most of what I intended to say, but um, no, uh, none of my reading of this resolution restricts any comment that I'm aware of that's been made at that podium, uh, at least since this council president has taken over. And I'm not aware of, I don't recall, a lot of people have been removed from the meetings for disruptive behavior and interrupting people who were at the podium speaking. I'm not aware of a member of this community or any speaker that was removed for their content of what they were saying while during this council president's term or the previous one, for that matter, um, at least that I recall. Uh, and yes, there absolutely are children watching. I'm pretty confident my son is watching right now. He has his own favorite lineup of people who come to speak, some of which are negative. If he was here, he would probably be with you yelling at me about getting the Xbox fixed. Um, and uh, so I support this resolution. I think it actually encourages public comment um, and that there has been an, perhaps uh, genuine but misguided misrepresentation or mischaracterization of the intent of this resolution. I'd also like to make a motion to call the question unless there's any other comments. There's a motion on the floor to call the question. Uh, the second and made by Councilor Minnick. I guess I could withdraw that motion if we're prepared to move forward so we don't have to do two votes. Okay, are we prepared to move forward? Okay. I'll withdraw that motion uh, if we're prepared to move forward with the vote. Okay. Um, can we just have a uh, roll call vote on this resolution? Vice President Heyman? Yes. Secretary Billups is a yes. Councilor Billup, uh, Councilor Minnick? Yes. Councilor Wagner? No. President Tunis? Yes. Councilor Banto? I say yes. Councilor Brandis? Yes. Councilor Andrusco? No. Councilor Wentz? No. Councilor Silva? No. Councilor Blackwell? Yes. Seven, four, seven yes and four no. Okay. Uh, passes. I want to thank the Law and Government Committee for their work on this resolution. Um, next item on the agenda, it's our solicitor. Uh, thank you very much, President Tunis. Uh, one is I want to say it's a pleasure to work with uh, CAO Jones again in a different venue. 
It's uh, he has definitely set up a lot of controls and coordinating our office uh, with the department heads and regular meetings to make sure we're all communicating and getting the best value uh, from a service that the Upper Darby department heads can get from our office and working with myself, Mr. Gallagher, Ms. Marcini and, and Ms. Bryant. Um, I know there has been uh, public comment and I reviewed the um, YouTube or uh, Facebook from the last council meeting. So I do want to just reiterate um, a, a couple sentences on the legality of the purchase of 3620. This says nothing different than what Mr. Uh, Gallagher presented at the last meeting, uh, but I just wanted to clarify things. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read an email that was sent to council yesterday uh, from my office, just so they understood. And attached to that email was a copy of Ordinance 3013, which was the McCosey era ordinance purchasing the same property. Ordinance 3139, the ARPA business district ordinance, as was said, both in the therefore clauses and in the, the whereas clauses. Uh, a letter from uh, no, uh, November 1st, 2023, going back and forth between Ms. Marcini from my office Ms. LaRue, who is your Director of Economic Development, uh, and referencing conversations with Mayor Keffer. Third, there was also a narrative from Ms. LaRue talking about the purchase of this property and the impetus for going ahead and buying it, which was that it was um, uh, that BP, uh, the owner of the property, uh, was, in the, was going ahead and marketing it at the time. And it was the thought of Ms. LaRue and others in the administration that in front of a, a trolley stop and in front of the business district, that was imperative that the administration move forward on the purchase of 3620. Uh, then there are uh, some pictures of 3620 uh, Garrett Road, which talks about where it fits in in the, uh, in the commercial district and where it is physically located. Also, too, I want to note in 3013, uh, one of the things that I want to bring up is the legal description put forward by the McCosey administration reference that this parcel, uh, as described, the same parcel we're talking about, it adjoins Garrett Road West and Edmonds Avenue in McCosey era legal description. So I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the rest of the paragraphs I sent to council. On 8-8-2023, uh, council approved ordinance 3139. Uh, which council has access to and the public has seen. That went into effect 10 days after passage in accord with section C-404 of the Home Rule Charter because prior Mayor Keffer neither signed nor vetoed this legislation. Two, as stated in the recitals of Ordinance 3139, council and the administration's intent was to allocate ARPA funds, quote, for the revitalization of Upper Darby business districts. That's in the whereas clauses. In the therefore clause, it talks about for the purchase to benefit business. And in section one, it states the $100,000 was allocated for Garrett Road West, Edmonds to Childs. Three, 3620 Garrett Road is a triangular shaped lot previously owned by BP Oil in the commercial one zoning district. And section 55-19 of the township zoning ordinance states that the C1 district where it is in provides for the establishment of commercial districts which will facilitate the development and or maintenance of appropriate locations for the conduct of commercial and service oriented businesses in areas of Upper Darby Township, which are appropriate to meet the needs of the community and which are consistent with the township's comprehensive plan and supplemental detailed land use plans. Four, 3620 Garrett Road sits along Garrett Road West and Edmonds Avenue as is described in 3139 and 3013. So previously in 2013, council authorized the purchase of that same property uh, by ordinance 3013 attached, which contains a legal description. Six, section uh, 1A of ordinance 3139 states that the allocations including $100,000 for Garrett Road West are to be administered by the, 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 the director of the economic development, which was Ms. Rue. Ms. LaRue provided a narrative, which was given to Ms. Marcini and, such, and Mayor Keffer, which is seen, which was given to council, um, that details that the business development and revitalization funds of the acquisition of the commercial property at 3620 Garrett Road is beneficial to the community. Eight, section 1B of the ordinance requires that the compliance officer ensure that allocation is in compliance with American Rescue Funds, ARPA, and UHY, our ARPA consultant, determine that 3620 
was eligible to, eligible to be purchased uh, with ARPA funds. The township commissioned an appraisal that valued the property at, at $30,000. The solicitor's office noted the legal description attached to Ordinance 3013, signed by Mayor Mikosi in 2013, described 3620 Garrett Road as adjoining Garrett Road West and Edmonds Avenue, and relating to the effect of that previous Ordinance 3013. A question was raised, was that still in effect? By both Ms. LaRue and my understanding members of the public and council. And our office opined that 3013 did not need to be amended because any appropriation under 3013 expired after three years per section C-910 of the Home Rule Charter and Ordinance 3139, which contained a repeal clause that would have uh, repealed automatically any prior ordinances of parts thereof that are inconsistent with 3139. I understand that some members of the public and council may not agree, but this is our office's opinion. Thank you. All right, thank you, Solicitor Kilkenny. Um, next is old business, uh, Councillor Brannis. Thank you, President Tunis. I feel like I'm talking a lot today. I love it. So the last meeting, the March 6th meeting um, during public forum, um, one of our constituents um, decided to uh, make a statement based on a topic that we commonly hear uh, sitting here. Um, and the statement, I don't know whether it was meant to be misleading or was just incorrect at the time of saying it, but obviously <laughs> for me having a master's degree in linguistics and literature, I figured since I know how to read, I might as well just repeat this verbatim that was said so we can make the correction because having um, incorrect information out there is not necessarily beneficial to the public. So the statement, and I quote, and again, this is verbatim. If you wanna go back and watch the video from the March 6th meeting, please do. Quote, I'd also like to make a statement that I know you can't see, but for people on council, this is what your trash and sewer fee bill looks like. The top one is blue, the bottom one is yellow, the top one is for the sewer fee, the blue one's sewer, and the yellow one's trash, okay? They are due no later than June 20th, okay? So you would have gotten this in the mail. There would have been a white one on top that would have had your tax bill on it. If you have a mortgage company, they would get your tax bill. If you're lucky enough to own your home outright, you need to write a check for three of them. Get your checkbooks out, write them, uh, and write them. The taxpayers and residents have to do it. You all need to do it too, the blue one and the yellow one. You just raise them, so you should be familiar with them." End quote. Now, the only reason why I bring this up is because, again, I think that the public should know, and the residents sitting here should know, and anybody else here on council should know, including myself, here is my tax bill. Okay, I have a mortgage company, so I'm not worried about the top portion. And yes, you are correct. The sewer fee is blue. The trash collection fee is yellow. Nowhere on here does it say that it is due by June 20th. Now, if you look at it, they do have columns of when things are due. Let's see, they both have a column that says payment through June 20th with a certain amount, um, that being $275, $275 for the uh, sewer fee and 315 for the uh, township collection or trash collection fee. Now, now they have also listed, they have, I, and I said, Miss, I don't know whether it was to be misleading or Ms. just Dugan, this is your only warning, okay? The next one says payment after June 20th. Of course, it is a higher payment but you have that. And at the top of each one of these, it says payment accepted until 12-31-2024, after which unpaid bills will be sent to an outside collection agency. So for people who want to check, and you have every right to check on these, because like I said, you know, we went through this. I had another payment that went through the other day. So I've been taking care of it just like I promised I would. And I've been transparent with you ever since. But they will not know who, for the entire year of 2024, who hasn't paid this until probably the first week of January. So I am thinking that I am saving a lot of people time, probably six months worth of time, um, you know, trying to seek out that information as well as not wasting our time at meetings, 
bringing up the topic of council members and their fees that they may or may have not paid or that they are in arrangement of paying. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Brandis. Is there anyone else for old business? Uh, Councillor? Yeah, um, I'd like to ask about my question I had for Resolution 724 before it was called to question. Okay. So, uh, uh, CAO uh, Jones, you said that it was 75000 a year. Was that to digitize old records? Yes, and, and to digitize, we drew a line in the sand. I think we went back either one or two years to digitize all the records from that point forward. That were being that, that, destroyed? That we had, that, were, that we would, we would, yes, that we would destroy, we destroyed them after we digitized them, yes. Okay, so um, what, did, did you at that time like institute a policy where you were digitizing current records yes. as they were being created? Yes. What, I mean, do you have like an idea of what the cost of that was? Well, it was, I can't, re I can't recall the cost because we were, I know part of it is we were getting equipment and we were getting quotes on equipment so that we can digitize them in the house versus uh, having them digitized by a server. But we did put the policy in place. Uh, we hadn't gotten the, all of the equipment purchases and we still were going through digit by department. We were destroying records, digitizing theirs then destroying the records that were digitized. So we didn't get through all of the departments. CAO, I didn't know what the total microphone. Was. I, didn't know what the, I didn't know what the total cost was because we were, I think we got through the first year we started with Complex, when, which was L and I here, codes and, and building in, in Norristown, and that was a lot. And then we were moving to the next one, which would be a lot, which was planning and zoning. And so those two took up the first, year and a half two years of that i don't i don't know what uh at this point what the entire organization's cost would look like but i know when we got the initial estimate when we put the uh when we we went out for we went co-stars but we find the vendor that we wanted to do it we they interviewed everybody every department looked at every every records and they gave us a quote and i said three years seventy five thousand dollars a year rather than trying to bite it off, knowing that it was going to take a lot of time. So for us to like maybe institute moving forward that we would digitize documents as they're created, you don't feel like there would be that kind of excessive cost was, was part of basically hiring a service to digitize records before destruction, like some like third party vendor. Well, I think if, if you if you get into you, you have to draw a line uh, into how far back you want to digitize. Right. And once you draw that line, that's gonna, that's gonna help determine the scope of the project. And then the second part of it is, how do you handle everything you're creating from that point forward? And, and so what our goal was, everything we create from that point forward, move it to being uh, those things that the law allowed us to have as electronic documents, move those to electronic documents anyway, reduce paper, stop creating paper. We stopped sending paper agendas to council uh, and, and it was all digital to council. And so, you know, part of that involved getting every council person uh, a, a tablet and that we, and we, you know, and they'd have it on their tablets rather than create those papers. So you gotta have a, a, a process in mind and, and, you know, and that involved conversation with council about are you good for that? Do you want to do that? Uh, and, and as we went through budget discussions and setting up this uh, digitation process, obviously there were discussions with me uh, from the department heads in terms of you know, what it is that we, we needed to do scope-wise for them. And ultimately, as we presented the uh, budget to council, we talked about what it was in terms of scope-wise for, for the city and also what my recommendation was in terms of what's affordable for the city as well in terms of doing it. So as if we look at this uh, for Upper Darby, we've got to have all of those internal conversations that we can come back to council in and, 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 and the budget process and work with the mayor and come back to council in the budget process and say, this is what we're projecting this is going to cost. This is what we're recommending as a starting point. This is what we're recommending as how long this process would actually take. 
Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Councillor Silver. It's no further old business. Uh, Councillor Blackwell. So I just want to um, state that on Friday, March 29th, from 5.30 to 7 p.m., there will be um, the last town hall uh, meeting of the 4th District at the Highland Park Fire Department basement at 24 Park Avenue in Epidari, Pennsylvania. So just to repeat, on Friday, March 29th, from 5.30 to 7 o'clock p.m., it will be the last 4th District Town Hall meeting. Also, I would like to give a special kudos or thank you um, out to a local resident as an unknown Shiro, um, Anita Giacconi. Um, she uh, contacted me regarding a pop-up cleanup in the 4th District. We cleaned up uh, on March 16th. Parker Avenue, North Linden, Meadowbrook, Waters, and Terrace. Um, so any resident that has a concern regarding particular blocks, just reach out to me um, for the 4th District, and we can get together to clean it up. You, It doesn't have to be organized or planned. We just do the best that we can do for the community. So that was done on March 16th. Um, so again, thank you um, to our unknown Shiro's, Miss Anita Giacconi. Also, um, I think I'm going to uh, refer this to Councilwoman and Secretary Billups regarding the May 11th Resource Fair Mental Health. She may want to mention that as well. Oh, wait, please hold for a second. Do you, are, are you concluded with your? Okay. Yes. Thank you, President. Thank you, Councilor Blackwell, and thank you for everything you do. Secretary Billups. Thank you, Councilwoman Blackwell. Um, yeah, so just um, just a refresher reminder that um, um, Councilwoman Blackwell and I are um, we are in collaboration with for May 11th for the Resource Mental Health Fair. It's going to be at Observatory Park in conjunction with um, Fruits of the Family Table, and um, we will be making flyers up to make sure that everyone will come out. And it's going to be an exciting day. So hopefully, you guys will come out. So we'll make sure that everyone will get a flyer for that day. Thank you. Exciting. Thank you, Secretary Billups. No further old business, uh, new business, uh, Councillor Brannis. Um, uh, real quickly, and just because you've already brought it up, that um, Representative Curry and Representative Boyd will be having their shredding event this weekend on Saturday uh, at the Upper Darby High School uh, from 9 to 12. Also, with that, if you have tablets or laptops or hard drives that you need to have destroyed, we are going to have Cyber Crunch there as well. Okay. Councillor Blackwell? I'm sorry. I just have to do a special thank you to the administration as well because I came at the last minute to get copies out to the residents that are not on social media, and the administration was able to help me and make copies. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Blackwell. Um, the partnership with this administration has been um, really good. I look forward to doing more things like that in the future. Um, if there's no further uh, new business, um, Councillor Silva. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a motion to remove the divider between the public and the council. I second that motion. Uh, there's a motion made um, for the divider. Yeah, the rope. Yeah, the little rope thing. I mean, not it the was, wall. I, I'm not talking a major construction. We never had a rope before. Um, so there's a motion on the floor and second. Is there any discussion from any council members? Uh, Councilor Banta? Yeah, uh, I mean... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, President Tony, I think... I, I want to stand with my so uh we, let, let let the resident be comfortable. Let them come in and I believe they will people will be uh responsible enough. Um solicitor Kilkenny, um if I as the council president would like to remove it, do we need a vote or no? Yeah. All right, so it will be removed in the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um moving on a motion to adjourn. All in favor? <laughs>